Chapter 11, School. He brought them a low type of egg cup full of hot water and a corner of soap, cut off a big cake to wash with. They stood on each side of the bowl. Little Bear stripped off his bandolier, which left him naked to the waist. Then he lost no time plunging his arms in and began energetically rubbing the whole of the top part of his body with, with wet hands. Throwing water everywhere, he made a lot of noise about it and seemed to be enjoying himself, though he ignored the soap. Boone was a different matter. Omri had already noticed that Boone was none too fussy about being clean. And in fact, he didn't look as if he'd washed or shaved for weeks. Now he approached the hot water gingerly, eyeing Omri as if no as if to excuse me, as if to see how little washing he could actually get away with. Come on, Boone! Off with that shirt. You can't wash your neck with a shirt on, said Omri briskly, echoing his mother. With extreme reluctance, shivering theatrically, Boone dragged off his plaid shirt, keeping his hat on. I should think your hair could do with a wash, too, said Omri. Boone stared at him. Wash my hair? he asked incredulously. Washing hair is for women. It ain't for men. But he did consent to rub his hands lightly over the piece of soap, although grimacing hideously as if it were some slimy dead thing, and wash at least the palms of his hands. Then he rinsed them hastily, smeared some water on his face, and reached for his shirt without even drying himself. Boon, said Omri sternly. Just look at Little Bear. You called him dirty, but at least he's washing himself thoroughly. Now you just do something about your neck and well under your arms. Boone's look was now one of stark horror. Under my arms? And your chest, I should think. I'm not taking you to school all sweaty. Heck, don't you go running down sweat. It's sweat that keeps a man clean. After a lot of bullying, Omri managed to get him to wash at least a few more bits of himself. You'll have to wash your clothes sometime, too, he said. But this was too much for Boone. Ain't nobody gonna touch my duds, and that's final, he said. Ain't been washed since I bought them. Water takes all the stuffing out of good cloth. Without all the dust and sweat, they don't keep you warm no more. At last they were ready, and Omri pocketed them and ran down to breakfast. He felt tense with excitement. He'd never carried them around the house before. It was risky, but not so risky as taking them to school. He felt that having family breakfast with them secretly in his pocket was like a training for taking them to school. Breakfast in his house was often a dicey meal anyway, with everybody more or less bad-tempered. Today, for instance, Adil had lost his football shorts and was blaming everybody in turn and their mother had just discovered that Gillen, contrary to his assurances the night before, when he had wanted to watch television, had not finished his homework. Their father was grumpy because he had wanted to do some gardening, and it was raining again. I know I put them in the laundry basket, Adil was saying fretfully. If you did, I washed them, in which case they're back up in your drawer, said his mother. But you didn't because I didn't, and they're not. Now listen to me, Gillen. It's only a bit of history, one mini little castle to draw and a tiny paragraph to write, said Gillen. I can do it at school. Stinking climate, muttered their father. Those onion sets will rot if I don't get to them soon. Gillen, did you borrow them? I've got my own. Omri ate his cereal in silence, grinning to himself, hugging his secret. He slipped a couple of cornflakes into his pockets. I bet Omri took them said Adil suddenly. Omri looked up. Took what? My shorts. What on earth would I want your shorts for? It might be your idea of a joke to hide them, Adil retorted. This was not as outrageous as it sounds. It had until very recently been a common form of revenge, when Adil or Gillen had been specially unbearable for Omri to sneak some valuable possession and hide it. Now, however... Omri felt very far away from such baby babyishness and was quite insulted. Don't be stupid, he said. So you did, said Adil in triumph. I did not. You're red in the face. That's proof you're guilty. 
I swear, said Omri. They're probably under your bed, said their mother to Adil. Go up and have a look. I have looked. I've looked everywhere. Oh, my gosh. It's starting to hail now, said their father despairingly. So much for the apple blossom. Under cover of the moans that went up about the prospect of no apples in the autumn and the exclamations about the size of the hailstones, Omri slipped his coat on and ran through the bouncing ice lumps to school. On the way, he stopped under a protecting yew tree and took the little men out. He showed them each a large hailstone, which to them was the size of a football. Now, when we get to school, said Omri, you must lie very still and quiet in my pockets. I'm putting you in separate ones because I can't risk any fighting or quarreling. If you are seen, I don't know what will happen. Danger? asked Little Bear, his eyes gleaming. Yes, not of death so much. You might be taken away from me. Then you'd never get back to your own time. You mean we'd never wake up out of here this here drunken dream? said Boone. If that's how you look at it, no. But Little Bear was staring at him very thoughtfully. Own time, he said musingly. Very strange magic. Omri had never arrived at school with more apprehension in his heart, not even on spelling test days. And yet he was excited, too. Once he had taken a white mouse to school in his blazer pocket, he'd planned to do all sorts of fiendish things with it, like putting it up his teacher's trouser leg. He had, a, he had had a man teacher then, or down the back of a girl's neck, or just putting it on the floor and letting it run around and throw the whole class into chaos. He hadn't actually dared do anything with it except let it prep out and make his neighbors giggle. This time he had no such plans. All he was hoping was that he could get through the day without anybody finding out. Patrick was waiting for him at the school gate. Have you got him? Yes. His eyes lit up. Give! I want him! All right, said Omri, but you have to promise that you won't show him to anybody. Omri reached into his right hand pocket closed his fingers gently around Boone, and passed him into Patrick's hand. The moment Omri had let go of him, things started to happen. A particularly nasty little girl called April, who had been right across the playground at the moment of the transaction, was at Patrick's side about two seconds later. What have you got there, then? What did he give you? She asked in a raucous voice like a crow's. Patrick flushed red. Nothing. Push off. He said. At once, April pointed her witchy finger at him. Look at Patrick blushing. Look at Patrick blushing, she squawked. Several other children speedily arrived on the scene, as a certain type of child will whenever somebody is getting taunted. And soon, Patrick and Armory found themselves surrounded. What's he got? Bet it's something horrid. Bet it's a slimy toad. A little wriggly worm, more like. A beetle, like him. Omri felt his blood begin to get hot in his head. He longed to bash them all one by one, or better still, all at once. A giant knocking down hordes of enemies like Skittles. He imagined them all rolling backward down a long, wide flight of steps in waves, bowled over by his flashing fist and flying feet. The best he could manage in reality, though, was to lower his head and keeping his hand cupped stiffly over his left pocket barge through the chanting, excuse me, the chanting circle. He caught one of them a good butt in the stomach, which was rather satisfying. Patrick was hot on his heels, and they belted across the playground and in through the double doors, which fortunately had just been opened. Once inside, they were relatively safe. There were teachers all over the place, and any kind of fighting or taunting above a sly pinch or a snide whisper was out. Patrick and Omri slowed to a walk, went to their places and sat down, trying to look perfectly calm and ordinary so as not to attract their teacher's attention. Their breathing gave them away, though. Well, you two, what are you puffing about? Been running? They glanced at each other and nodded. So long as you've not been fighting, she said, giving them a sharp look. She always behaved, that, behaved as if a little fight was a long step along the road to hell. Neither of the boys got much work done during the morning. They couldn't concentrate. Each of them was too aware of the passenger in his pocket. Both Little Bear and Boone were restless, particularly Little Bear. 
Boone was naturally lazier. He kept dozing off in the dark, and then waking on the little jump that made Patrick very nervous. But Little Bear was scrambling about the whole time. It was during the third period when they were all in the main hall listening to the headmaster, whose name was Mr. Johnson, announcing plans for the end of the year show. That Little Bear got really sick and tired of being imprisoned and started to take a drastic action. The first thing Omri knew was a sharp prick in his hip, as if an insect had stung him. For a moment, he was silly enough to think an ant or even a wasp had somehow gotten into his clothes, and he only just stopped himself from slapping his hand instinctively against his side to squash it. Then there came another jab, sharper than the first, sharp enough, in fact, to make Omri let out a short yelp. Who did that? asked Mr. Johnson irritably. Omri didn't answer, but the girl sitting next to him began giggling and staring. Was that you, Omri? Yes. I'm sorry. Something stuck into me. Patrick, did you stick him with a pencil? Such a thing was not unknown during assemblies when they were bored. No, Mr. Johnson. Well, be quiet when I'm talking. Another jab. This time, Little Bear meant business and kept his knife embedded. Omri shouted, Ouch! and jumped to his feet. Omri, Patrick, leave the hall. But, but, but I didn't, began Patrick. Out, I said, shouted Mr. Johnson furiously. They left, Patrick walking normally and Omri dancing. About shouting, ow, ow, at every step as Little Bear continued to dig the needle point of his knife in. The whole school was in hysterics of laughter, and Mr. Johnson was frothing with rage. By the time they reached the swing doors, they departed. Outside they ran, well, Patrick ran, and Omri performed a series of sideways steps to the far end of the playground. On the way, Omri plunged his hand into the pocket, seized Little Bear, and dragged him out. The agony stopped. Safe in a sheltered corner behind the, behind some privet bushes, Omri held his persecutor at eye level and shook him violently, the way you shake a bottle of medicine. He called him the worst names he could possibly think of. When he'd run out of swear words, which was not for some time, he hissed like Mr. Johnson. What did you mean by it? How dare you? How dare you stick your knife into me? Little Bear dare. I'm keep in dark many hours. Little Bear want to see school place. Not lie in hot dark. No breathe, no see. Want and joy. I warned you you wouldn't. It's not my fault you made me bring you. Now you've got me into trouble. Little Bear looked mulish, but he stopped shouting, seeing this evidence that a truce was on its way. Omri calmed down a bit, too. Listen, I can't let you see because I can't take you out. You have no idea what would happen if I did. If any of the other children saw you, they'd want to grab you and mess you about. You'd hate it. And it would be terribly dangerous, too. You'd probably get hurt or killed. You've got to lie quiet till school's over. I'm sorry if you're bored, but it's your own fault. Little Bear thought this over, and then he said a most astonishing thing. Want Boone? What? Your enemy? Better enemy than alone in dark. Patrick had taken Boone out of his pocket. The little cowboy was sitting on his hand. They were gazing at each other. Omri said, Boone, Little Bear says he wants you. He's lonely and bored. Well, ain't that just too bad, said Boone sarcastically. After he tried to kill me, now he's come all over all lovey-dovey. Listen, you redskin, he shouted through cupped hands across the yawning gulf between Patrick and Henry. I don't care how lonesome you are. I don't care if you drop down dead. The only good engine's a dead engine. Did you hear me? Little Bear turned his head hauntingly away. I think he's lonely too, really, said Patrick. In a whisper, he's been crying. Oh, no, not again, said Henry. Honestly. Boone, at your age, just then they heard their teacher calling them from the school door. Come on, you two. You've not got the day off, you know. Give me your knife, said Omri to Little Bear on a sudden impulse. Then I'll put you two together. With a only a moment's hesitation, Little Bear handed over his knife. Omri slipped it into the small breast pocket of his shirt, then which was empty, and where it would easily, where it wouldn't easily get lost. Then he said to Patrick, Let me have Boone. No. 
just for the next lesson. Then at lunchtime, you can have both of them. They'll keep each other company. You can't do each other much damage in a pocket. Reluctantly, Patrick handed Boone over. Armory held them one in each hand so they were face to face. Be good, you two. Try talking to each other instead of fighting. But whatever you do, don't make any noise. And he slipped them both into his left hand pocket. And he and Patrick ran back to the school building.